those of you who know me fairly well, which is probably almost all of you, um, understand that I'm not a big one for titles. Um, people, I, I do like the title pastor. That's a, that's a great thing to be. Uh, that's a wonderful title. Um, but if someone calls me bud and not pastor, that's quite okay. It doesn't bother me at all. I can remember uh, back in 1985 when Mike Prinovich was coming on staff and he was moving into the community and, and he was securing a phone, 330-927-5601. And, um, and they asked him, um, when they put it in the phone book, do you want the word reverend next to it? Well, you know, Mike, he was never getting an easy answer from Mike. And he said, have you ever read the word reverend in the phone book? It talks about do respect to be handled with all and then just goes on he said would you want that next to your name and the girl was like no and so so he said he didn't want it next to his either there are titles that some are really really good and valuable and some um you just kind of wonder in our culture we really respect some titles and and i think the clergy even though it's gone down a lot in years it you know still has a little bit of respect in some circles doctors Probably have gone down in some places too, but they still have some respect. Professors, um, same story. Um, in, in some worlds, uh, one that I hang in a lot, people like the name coach. I, I know that to me, I love coaching. I don't care if they call me coach, it doesn't matter to me whatsoever, but I enjoy coaching and being with people and kids and having impact there and all that, that's great. But I notice when I'm around other coaches and especially in, in the other sports, it's like, it's like a, a great thing for somebody to call a coach, coach. And so that's really big. Another world that's not my world that does that is the world of food. Now I dwell in the world of food, but um, some of them call each other chef. That seems to be like a really holy title in, in some circles. Uh, it's impressive, and to some people it's important, and they really, really uh, thrive on that. Uh, as they work hard for that title, and they really want to be honored and recognized by it. How would you like to be a lady named Rahab? She was given a title 3,300 plus years ago, and it sticks. And it's not a really good one at all. In Joshua chapter 2, in verse 1, it says this, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, and go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. Hmm. She was given a very unflattering title, I would say, and it stuck with her all these years. You know, her story is a story of God's grace in the life of someone who had a very horrible background. Now, there have been some theologians over the years that have tried to water this down a little bit and try to make her feel a whole lot better uh, about herself. Uh, some of them will tell you that, well, it really doesn't mean what you and I think it means when it says a prostitute or a harlot or a whore or whatever your translation has. In fact, they will tell you that the Hebrew word that's used there in its root meaning actually means to feed. So maybe it's talking about a woman who ran a restaurant or a hotel and was very hospitable toward people. And, and maybe that's what it's kind of implying couple problems. The actual Hebrew word, not just the root, but the word itself means a harlot. And when the, um, when the Jewish people translated the Old Testament into Greek in what we call the Septuagint, and as well as the Greek New Testament that refers to her, both Greek uh, writings use the same word. It's the Greek word you're familiar with, porne, which is... Um, the word that we get the word pornography from, or porno. And so uh, it's not a really, it's hard to really water this thing down. It's talking about a lady of ill reputation. However, um, it's very possible that this lady not only had that bad reputation, but she had herself a pretty prosperous business, maybe. 
That's implied by her, uh, her setup, her living conditions as to where she's at. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But let me give you just a little bit of the historical background as to where Israel is at at this time. You know Moses? Well, Moses is gone. He's passed away. And in chapter 1 of Joshua, God had already chosen Joshua to be the leader, and Moses had worked with him, and God had put his stamp of approval on Joshua. Joshua was going to lead the nation of Israel where Moses was only allowed to see from afar. He was going to lead them into the promised land. However, there was an entire generation of the Israelites who had lived in Egypt that were not allowed to enter into the promised land, and uh, God wouldn't let them go in. And that whole group of people, because of their persistent sin, because of their stubborn rebellion against God, uh, God had them die while they were wandering in the wilderness. Probably more than a million of them had perished in that journey. Of that whole generation, that whole large group of people coming out of, uh, out of Egypt, only two men were allowed to go into the promised land. One of them's name was Joshua. The other one was Caleb. They were the ones who did not perish. Everybody 21 years old and older died, but they were allowed to go in. And it's because of their report that they gave. You can read about this in Numbers chapter 13 and, and chapters 14. But Moses selected 12 people to go out and to spy on the land. And when they came back, two of them said, this is amazing. The land is prosperous. It's beautiful. It's got great potential for us. And God's going to give it to us. And the other 10 are like, you guys are crazy. We're like, they're like giants in that land. They're huge. They're, they're unimaginably big. And we're grasshoppers in their sight. There's absolutely no way that we can defeat them. We can't do this. We can't attack those people. It can't be done. There's obstacles. Obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off of Jesus. <laughs> and they saw plenty of them. Well, now here we are. We're in Je Joshua chapter 2, and we're approximately 38, 39 years later. And they're at the doorstep of the promised land. They're ready to go in. They're at Kadesh Barnea. And the book of Joshua has them sitting right there at the entrance to Canaan, ready to go in. And the Israelites have now encamped themselves. They're about seven miles east of the Jordan River, and they're straight across, directly across from Jericho. Jericho is on the other side, the west side. And so they're, you know, within 10 to 15 miles of it. And Joshua selects these two to go out. Joshua does it a little bit different than how Moses did it. Remember, Moses picked 12 had them come back. They reported to all the people, telling them what they saw. Israel tried the popular opinion route, and it failed. So Joshua's going to do things a little bit different. Instead of sending out 12 spies, he sends out two. Now, I don't know why he picked two, but I do think it's more than coincidental that in the first group, only two of them got it right. So maybe that's what he was thinking, um, but he sent two out. And instead of re coming back and reporting to all the people, they were only going to report to Joshua. No one else even knew about this mission. Let me read the rest of those verses, 2 through 7, in Joshua chapter 2. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know who they were and where they came from. And at dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went, but if you go after them quickly, you may catch up with them. 
but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out of the gate, the gate was shut. Jericho was a very strategic location for Israel. Had a couple opening paths that went their directions. One of the paths would lead down to the southwest toward Jerusalem. The other one would go to the northwest toward the town of Ai and ultimately to Bethel. Very, very strategic places. The spies could easily slip in and fit in because this was a, a large town, a, ta a town that was very accustomed to having visitors come and, and be with them. And, and so they could just kind of go and, and be there. And somehow, we never are told how, they connect with Rahab, who runs a prostitution business, and they go into her her house. Now that would have helped their cause too because she would have been very accustomed to having customers come in confidentially. She didn't, you know, don't ask questions, don't tell anything. Um, that would have been normal for her. But this one was different. These two Israelites treated her with respect instead of what she was used to, to having done. Rahab's house would have been ideal for this mission. We learned in there that she lived on the wall. Now, I'm trying to figure out my best estimates. I should have got my uh, tape measure out, but I'm guessing that the width of this room is probably 30 to 40 feet, something like that. That would have been the width of uh, the, the wall. It was, it was 30 feet high, we know that, but it would have been very much like that as well. So if you could picture a wall that surrounds a city that's as wide and as high as this. And, um, and on top of it, there's houses. There's people who have houses after houses after house and a road or at least a walkway that would go down there. And she had a place up on the wall, which would have been ideal for these spies to be up there and to look out over the land and see what's out there and see what other towns and villages and see what the crops could have been like and lots of advantages to this. By God's design, Rahab's heart was ready for these visitors. Let me read to you uh, verses 8 through 11. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on all of us, so that all who live in this country are, are melting in fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to uh, Siho and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. Hmm. That's a very interesting assessment by her. Now, you remember that she was the one protecting these spies. Uh, she could have, most likely, when the, when the king, the, which was a local mayor, basically, when he sent his people up to find out where are these guys if if she would have turned them in she might have been rewarded and maybe pretty handsomely she could have made something out of this but she didn't do that she hides them up on the roof and the flax flax is just their crop that they had gathered and they piled them up or stacked them or or tied them together and this was a hiding place you kind of get the impression that she's done this before maybe with some of her customers. And there happened to be a, a rope that they could just happen to climb out with too, which I'm sure has happened before for them as well. She misdirects the guards. She lies to them. That's a very tough question. Is lying in the Bible justified? Does the Bible condone that? I have in your... Um, 
in your outline some passages uh, of Scripture. All of them talk about the character of God and how he cannot lie, cannot allow lying even in his presence. Some theologians, again, try to water this down a little bit. And they say, well, technically, it's not a lie because it's a military feint. So whatever you do in the military to win a war justifies whatever you do. So it's really not a lie. It's, that's one view. Some of them say, well, you know what? Yes, it is a lie. But a lie is acceptable if you're doing it for the good of greater. And uh, I don't see that in Scripture. I think God says that lying is sin. Scripture never commends this lie or any other lie, but he, it commends her. It's not commending her because of the lie. It's commending her because of her faith. Did you hear what she said about the nation of Israel and about their God? It has been obvious to everybody. We've been watching you for the last four decades as you march through the land here and there, and it's really obvious that God has empowered you you have something different than any other nation, any other group of people have had. God is with you. She exhibited faith. It's a new faith. It's a very weak faith. It's an undeveloped faith. But it did cause her to act, to do something showing that she trusted God. She placed herself and everything that she had in the hands of this God when she became this traitor to her own people. She turned down what could have been an easy reward, but, uh, and she placed herself strongly in danger and staked everything on the God of Israel. A.W. Tozer said once, God is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And this is a lady who probably never heard of A.W. Tozer 3,300 years ago. But she actually lived out some of that. Weak and feeble faith. She didn't know what she was doing. She messed up some, some things in her life. That was normal for her. Nothing but faith could have made such a dramatic change in the life of this person. Her character changed instantly. It was an amazing faith that she had. Verses 12 through 14 say, Now then, please swear to me, she says, Swear by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives is what the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. Wow. She had a place for them to hide. She had a way to help them escape. Fear was her motivation. You know, fear is a pretty valid motivator, I think. Fear causes us to do a lot of things. Um... I drive according to the law most of the time because of fear. Um, I don't want to have my checkbook bombarded by the state or the government. There's a lot of things we do because of fear that motivates us. The people around her, all of them knew the same thing she knew, but they didn't respond that way. They didn't surrender their hearts to a God and surrender their property as part of the promised land. They may have been included in a much, much greater way if they did. After this happens, I think you know the story, don't you, about what happens with Jericho. We can all sing about the walls come tumbling down. Uh, the army, and it's a good Memorial Day lesson, isn't it? The army marches around the city. The next day, they march around the city again. The next day, they march around, and they do this. And on the seventh day, they don't march around once. They march around seven times. And at the right time, uh, they shout and scream, and they blow their trumpets, and they make all kinds of noise, and the walls just crumble. They just fall apart. And there's all kinds of explanations for that. Um, if I remember in our recent conflicts during Iraq, um, 
General Schwarzkopf did not use that technique of marching around Iraq and blowing trumpets and shouting. Um, now, some people try again to water this down a little bit and will say, well, they didn't have that impact. It was an earthquake that happened. If that were true, and of course I don't believe that, but if that were true, what an incredible miracle that God did this earthquake at the exact second that they shouted and blowed their trumpets. That's pretty amazing. But anyhow, um, God did that. He, he wrecked that city. And all of it crumbled except for the section around where Rahab lived and her family. And they were spared. And you remember that the spies told her that in order to uh, identify where your house is, when we come back and when Israel's ready to take this over, we need a sign, and the scriptures describe it as a cord. It's a different word than the word rope used earlier that they could climb out, but there was a cord hung. It was a scarlet colored cord. Now, no one knows for absolute sure why, uh, why it had to be scarlet, but there's an awful lot of analogies made between that and the blood put on the doorpost in the Passover of Egypt, and of course the blood shared by our Savior Jesus Christ and all that he did. Here's what uh, Joshua says a little bit later in a couple other chapters. I spared you turning the pages. Chapter 6. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And... She lives among the Israelites to this day. Now, that was written later, obviously, by Joshua, but it's a great testimony of the fact that she was spared. And from chapter 6, verse 25 on, in the entire Old Testament, you never again read the name Rahab. She does come up three times in the New Testament, kind of interesting, in that great Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, she's mentioned there for the faith that she exhibited in rescuing the, the spies of Israel. In James chapter 2, she's spoken of in a chapter that's talking about how we're not saved by our works, but because of our faith, we do good works for God. And she's listed as an example of that. She's one of the people who, because of her faith in God, she knew this great God was going to prevail, that she did certain actions rescuing those. Faith had produced action, and as James said, faith without works is dead. If you're not producing something that shows that you are a follower of God, then you have reason to question the strength of your faith. You need to get stronger in that. But also in a very unique way, she's listed in, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 in the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, Savior. She's listed in there. Now that's highly unusual because in the Jewish ecology, they would never list women as part. Everything was male-dominated, male-oriented, and, and they would not do that typically. But you know what? In Matthew chapter 1, in that genealogy connecting Jesus to the line of Abraham and David, it not only mentions her, but it mentions a total of five different women. One of them, catch this, Tamar, the woman who was involved in incest uh, with her father-in-law, and she's listed there in the line of Jesus. Rahab, of course, the prostitutes listed there. Ruth who is a wonderful, great, tremendous story. We'll look at her uh, next week. But she was a Moabite, which was certainly an outcast and despised when it comes to the people of Israel and their relationship with them. And then, uh, of course, uh, then you come up to, um, and I'm not seeing that that far away, Bathsheba. I've heard of her before. Um, and I think she had a little thing, fling thing, with a guy named David, King David, and you know about the adultery and, and, and all of that that goes with that. And then there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, which she's as pure and, and good as you can be. However, she's pregnant and she's not married. So if nothing else, she's got a little bit of a slam on her reputation. What does all that communicate 
What do those five women in there say? Well, there's a lot it says. But you know what? It is telling us that God is able to work for good. He can do anything he wants. He can take anything he wants and make it turn out for something really, really good to bring glory to God and ultimately for us to conform us to the person of Jesus Christ. All of these women were outcast in some form or another. Even the worst of sinners can be redeemed. Even a prostitute like Rahab can be redeemed. Rahab's a reminder to us that God, by his grace, can redeem the most horrible of life. There's a lot of people in our country, in our culture today, that are living very substandard lives when it comes to God's um, desire for us. There's a lot, and some of you have probably experienced. You know, it's kind of interesting when you read some of the writings that Paul wrote. Uh, for instance, to 1 Corinthians, he lists a whole bunch of what we would say are some pretty big sins. And then says to the Corinthians, and some of you were like that once upon a time. We're all rescued from a very tainted past. We've all been rescued and saved from our sins because we're all sinners. And that's what God does. He redeems us. He's so great that he can even take your life and make it something of value and of worth and of honor to him. This weekend, we spent a lot of time, you know, thinking, and we should, and praying and honoring uh, those who have sacrificed so much for our country and for our freedoms, and, and that's very appropriate that we do that. That comes out of that whole concept of uh, caring for other people, taking care of their needs and helping them, which, of course, Jesus Christ has done more than anybody has ever done. His sacrifice for our sins is the greatest payment that ever has been made. And it's one that each one of us can respond to and have a relationship with when we know him as our savior. Rahab, very, very checkered past, but God was able to overcome that and bring a change in her that is eternal. Sorry that she has that title for all these years. I don't know what we're gonna call her in heaven, but uh, what, a, what a great act of God to change her, just like he can do that for any single one of us in rescuing us from our sins. Would you join me in prayer? Father, how we praise and honor you and lift up the person of Jesus Christ when we think about the redemption that we have from our own checkered past. Uh, our sins may be different than Rahab's, I would certainly think so. But their sins and their violations and their stains in the sight of a holy and righteous God. They are the deeds and the acts and the thoughts that our Savior Jesus died to save us from. And whatever the motivation, uh, our hearts need to be drawn to Jesus. We need to be redeemed by his blood. We need to be his children. Uh, secure in the person and the act of his righteous sacrifice. Thank you so much for the grace that you have shown to us, the mercy that we receive from you. God, each one here has a different story as we stand before you. And some of our titles include sinner. And yet uh, we can also add sinner saved by grace. We're so grateful for your love for reaching us. God, may each one of us draw close to you and may we glorify your name through the changes that you bring into our hearts and lives. It's through Christ our Savior we ask. Amen.